Uh, today, we have uh, Dr. Yaka Nolanya Hosler um, here to talk to us about um, from little babies in laboratories to neutral star mergers. Um, so, just a brief uh, introduction about Jackie. Uh, so, Jackie received her PhD in theoretical physics from Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany. Um, she then had postdoc position at the University of Sao Paulo, Colombia, and the University of Houston. Um, after her postdocs, she uh, accepted a faculty position at Rutgers University, um, and then in 2019, transferred to the University of Illinois at Bonner Shipping, where she is now a professor. Um, her research focuses on studying phase transition within the strongest fundamental forces of nature. Um, in addition to research, she serves on the APS Division of Nuclear Physics Executive Committee, um, and she recently finished serving on the Rank and APS Users Executive Committee. Um, she was awarded the a Sloan Research Fellowship and the Department of Energy Early Career Award. Um, and more recently, so this year, she um, became she was a she became a co-founder of the Muses Collaboration, mm -hmm. um, which is a multi-institutional theory collaboration that joins nuclear gravity, astrophysics, particle physics, and computer science together, um, where she is the cyber infrastructure computer. So uh, Jackie, if you want to go ahead and start. Sure, thank you, Laura. Um, let me just get everything going. Great. Hopefully everybody can see that and you can see my pointer as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So um, thank you very much for having me here today. It's a shame not to see everyone in person. Um, but anyways, feel free still to interrupt if you have any questions or anything's unclear. Uh, but I'm excited to talk to you a, a little bit about how we compare what we're doing in the laboratory to neutron star mergers and, and what is the intersection between these two. So kind of to get started, I just want to talk about what happens in the interior of a neutron star. And what I'm really interested in is what's happening at the very, very core of a neutron star, because that's what we can explore in the laboratory as well. Before we get started, we have to kind of remember what goes into neutron stars and neutron star mergers. And the thing that's really cool about them is that they combine all fundamental forces of nature in one. Um, you have electromagnetism, so you would have to deal with large magnetic fields. You obviously have visual signals where you can observe a neutron star. You have gravity because these are extremely, extremely heavy, dense objects. Um, and when they collide together, they produce gravitational waves, which can, has been measured already on Earth. Additionally, you have the strong force, and that's the part where I'm primarily interested in. Um, and this comes about because you have nuclei, you have nucleons, and, and we're hoping that at the center of these things, we actually have quarks. Um, and so we can use the strong force to explore these ideas. And last but not least is we also have the weak force. And so because of that, we have to deal with neutrinos, we have to think about strange decays, um, and there's a lot of extra complications that are built into neutron stars and neutron star mergers because of the uh, interplay between the strong and the weak force. So just to kind of remind ourselves the different scales that we'd be dealing with when we're talking about the strong force, and by that I mean quantum chromodynamics, um, is that we're dealing with the very, very tiniest scales. And essentially, we're not just looking inside the center of an atom of the nucleus, and we're not just looking at the proton, but we're really trying to crack open the proton um, and look for these objects called quarks and gluons. And so these are very, very tiny scales. This could be on the order of 10 to the minus 19 meters. Um, and what's kind of interesting is that these scales of, of matter are about the same distance away in terms of order of magnitude as one of the neutron stars that I'm gonna be talking about is in terms of order of magnitude's distance away from the earth. So that's around 10 to the 22 meters. Um, and this is, this is a really, really potentially heavy neutron star that I'll get to um, sort of in the middle of my talk. And so what actually is inside a neutron star? Well, this is kind of, it's a cartoon you know, these sort of exact things. Um, it's, a, it's a bit difficult, there's a lot of uncertainty here, um, but this is sort of our best understanding today, is uh, if you get to the very crust of a neutron star, you'd be contending with actual nuclei. Um, and so depending on what density you're at, you'd have different nuclei that would be favored. Basically, you start at something that's sort of symmetric. So in terms of the number of neutrons and protons, it's more or less equal. As you get to denser and denser, um, within the crust, you get more neutron rich nuclei. Um, and eventually you reach a point where you cannot even put another neutron into the nucleus and it just starts leaking out. And so this is known as the neutron drip line. And so at this point you're in the crust where you have some sort of mixture between nuclei and 
and nucleons that have leaked out of the nuclei. Now, if you continue to squeeze matter as you go toward the center of a neutron star, you eventually get these interesting formations where you get like these chains of, of um, neutrons and these are called the pasta phases. And so you can get lasagna, ganocchi, all these kind of things that you get in these interesting <laughs> shapes and strings of nuclei. Um, and then beyond that, at some point, you've continued to squeeze matter further and you get what we call liquid nuclear matter. And so this is where you really have to think about, you, you no longer are in these kind of configurations of, of nucleons clustered together, but rather it's just sort of this densely interacting liquid of neutrons and protons, and of course you have leptons in there. Um, and, and so you're looking at basically how these different nucleons interact. So you could think of like a two body interaction, three body, four body, and so forth. And so normally the theoretical models are kind of systematically adding more and more body interactions as you continue to squeeze the matter. Now, at some point you're gonna squeeze the matter so much that you expect one of two things to happen, or maybe both is you could reach a point where hyperons become stable, is essentially you get to very, very large densities and you actually have you know, strange particles that appear. Uh, and so this is entirely possible. The other possibility um, that could either happen after these strange particles appear or instead of them is that you could have deconfined QCD matter. And so what exactly that means is a little ambiguous. You could have some sort of like color superconducting phases, you could have some sort of quarks in there, how they interact, we, we don't necessarily know. There's, there's just way more question marks here at this point than answers. Um, but, but this is, then makes it some of the most intriguing questions is could we have basically a, a, a neutron star with some sort of stable phase of deconfined QCD matter? And that would be quite exciting. So the question is, why don't I just solve QCD? Right, I know what the Lagrangian is. I can write it down. I know how quarks interact and gluons. Why don't I just solve it? Well, it would be really tough because we have this Fermi and sign problem, um, and essentially the regime where I can calculate QCD on the lattice is vastly, vastly different uh, than where neutron stars exist. Neutron stars exist when you have many, many more baryons than antibaryons, whereas where I can actually calculate lat lattice QCD is when it's symmetric. I have the exact same number of baryons to antibaryons. And so these are completely vastly different regimes. And so I can't really take the knowledge that I have from lattice QCD and apply it to something with neutron stars. Um, and unfortunately, this is something that's probably not gonna be solved in my lifetime, but I know there's a lot of people that are thinking along the lines of quantum computing that you know maybe they'll come up with some cool idea. So what I mean when they're on vastly different regions is we have to kind of go to the idea of a phase diagram. So you've probably seen many phase diagrams either through other talks on the quark gluon plasma or you know just basically if you think of water how it varies with temperature and pressure these sort of ideas. So if I look at the QCD phase diagram and I'm looking at an isolated neutron star that's way down here in the bottom. Basically it's at zero temperatures and there's way 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 more matter than antimatter. Now, in contrast, the regime where I can actually do lattice QCD calculations is up here. It's extremely hot temperatures, the hottest uh, known on Earth, um, and the densities are essentially zero. You can do a Taylor series because that's what physicists know and love out to maybe about here, but at some point, it's it's way far different from where your, your neutron stars and even neutron star mergers are living. So we want to figure out ways to explore this, even though we don't know this from first principles. So one way we think of this is like, how can we melt protons? Like how can we get to some sort of deconfined quark and gluon matter? Um, well, at vanishing baryon densities, we know this already from first principles, um, but we can kind of get some sort of estimates in our head of what would require to melt a proton. And so, you know, the kind of the easiest way to think of it, well, let's get a temperature above the lightest, the mass of the lightest particle. So the mass of a, a pion is around 140 MeV. So if we reach temperatures above this, most likely we could start melting hadrons. Another way that, that you could think about this is I could actually plot all the known particles and just fit an exponential to this curve. This, this um, you, have, you find that you get this exponential mass spectrum. And from there, you can extract to temperature as well. It's known as the Hagerdown temperature. And it turns out that temperature is really close to 140 MeV as well. Now, the best way to do this is just to calculate it directly from first principles. And if you do this, you find 
Um, it's not a single temperature. It's actually, uh, it's a pseudo critical temperature because we find out it's a crossover phase transition. However, it's around 155 MeV. So it's interesting that our initial guess of like 140 MeV from the, the mass of pine isn't so crazy to start with. Now, what about if we want to, instead of melting the protons, we want to squeeze the protons until we can basically pop them open and get um, quarks and gluons. This would be at zero temperatures. Well, first let's start with the density of a nucleus. That's the nuclear saturation density. That's around 0 um, 0.16, uh, uh, one over um, femtometers cubed. We would expect that, you know, if we get at that density, it's not gonna basically um, have deconfined matter because that's, that's the density of a nucleus, right? But maybe a few times that density is, is a pretty reasonable guess. Um, and so the interesting thing is the maximum central density, this depends a little bit on the properties of neutron star, reaches around two to six times saturation density. So it seems like it could be reasonable that we could reach a state where we essentially squeeze the matter enough that the quarks and gluons are deconfined. However, we just don't know what that is. We don't know exactly what that transition density is, and we want to find observables and ways to explore that. So to do that, we need some sort of observables. And we can go, first of all, to the structure equations. We can think of this in a Newtonian limit. Um, how would we get a mass and radius of a neutron star? Well, we can assume our neutron star is like a fluid, um, and we take this little cube of a fluid. If we go back to you know physics 101, we know that the pressure is equal to force divided by the area. And so if we're taking like an infinitesimally small fluid, we can figure out what our pressure is. Now we also have to put in that our force is from gravity. And if we plug this in and we plug in how basically if you have a sphere, what would your mass be? You have then two couple differential equations. So then how do you solve these things? Well, basically what you need, you need your pressure and you need to relate that to your density, your mass density. Um, and you also need initial conditions. So essentially you systematically vary putting in different mass densities, you integrate until your pressure is zero because that pressure is zero, that's the surface of the star. And from there, you get a relationship between your mass and your radius. Radius is the R basically that you calculate when pressure goes to zero. Now, of course, life isn't quite that simple. Um, general relativity exists. So we go now to Einstein and this does add these extra terms um, to the, the pressure equation here, um, dmdr stays the same. But the idea here, and now we've rewritten things in terms of both the pressure and the energy density, because this, this is natural for us to have an equation state. Um, but then we plug in an equation state and we pop out a mass radius relation. Now, I should say this is not one point because we can vary our initial conditions. Um, and so depending on what the central density of the star is, you actually get different mass and radius, and they all kind of follow on a certain line, which I'll show you in a second. But this is how we connect what's in the interior of a neutron star to actual observations. So how does this look like? Well, if I have a pressure and an energy density, essentially here, let's take this equation of state, I then systematically put in heavier and heavier central densities, and I can plot out different masses here, as you can see. So here's my central density, and it increases, um, as I get heavier and heavier, it increases the mass. Now, the interesting thing is, in terms of how we use this to study the interior is that if we put in new degrees of freedom, then that changes my equation of state. So in this case, um, the black line is a very simple equation of state. It just has like neutron, protons, and leptons. Uh, and then if I want to add something a bit more exotic, I add a strange particle so I can add in hyperons, and this softens my equation of state, brings it down here. The effect that would have on a mass radius relationship is when you soften your equation of state, you can't reach as high of maximum masses. Um, at some point, the star becomes unstable. So in this case, you, you create basically a much lighter neutron star, and you can't create heavier neutron stars if hyperons are within the neutron star. So this is kind of how you have an equation state, how it relates to a mass and radius of a neutron star. So how do we measure these things? Well, right as of today, we have um, two main approaches and there's kind of a third as well that I'll get to in a little bit. But one of those is, oops, apologies, comes from NICER, which is sitting on the International Space Station right now. It's a NASA mission. 
Um, and what they do is they, uh, they pick, they have three different neutron stars they're observing right now um, in the universe. And they look specifically for ones that are pulsars. They want to have some sort of hot spot here. And so they watch it for a very long period of time and they watch how that hot spot rotates. Um, now, of course, there's a lot of modeling that goes into this, but the idea is, is if watching this hot spot can then give you um, a way to measure what the radius of these neutron stars are. Now, the masses are, are um, a little bit easier to calculate and these are things they, they understand from other techniques. But the idea is that you would then look at a few different neutron stars, maybe a heavier neutron star. This is something that would be much more sensitive to the potential of having quarks inside of it versus a lighter neutron star. And so you're kind of getting data points to look at what your mass radius curve is going to get. The other main technique, and this is something that's been in the news a lot, are neutron star mergers. So what happens in this case is that you could have two neutron stars in a binary system. They're rotating around each other. And as they get very, very close, um, you all of a sudden start emitting gravitational waves that we can actually measure on Earth. And so you can see here what the frequency would look like. Um, and this point here, there's kind of different stages that you would think about. So the very first stage is called the Inspiro. It's the stars have not touched each other yet, but they can already start feeling the gravitational pull of the other side. And that actually deforms them a little bit, right? So this is the tidal deformability. And that's something that can be extracted from gravitational waves. Now, this is the part of this, um, the stage where essentially temperatures are zero. They're much, much lower than it would matter for the equation state. However, this is something that is, has already been measured. And it's something that you could, that is directly connected to the equation state of the, uh, at zero temperature. So this is something that is a good constraint um, on your equation state. Now, eventually these two stars touch each other and you would have the merger. And this would be something that you would describe using numerical relativity. It could be very, very hot, um, 10 to the 12 Kelvin or in MEVs, it could be up to potentially hundred MEV. Um, the main issue here though, is that the signal to noise ratio gets pretty bad. Um, in fact, the noise is, is much larger than the signal. So we can't actually extract data from when they've touched at this point in time. Now, the last thing that happens is, is the final state, right? What is the remnant um, of these, the, these merged neutron stars? And if that turns into another neutron star or if it turns into a black hole, that gives us new information as well. Um, you can also get information on what this, this uh, ring down as it goes to a black hole would look like and, and what this frequency would look like as well. But again, there's there's issue of signal to noise ratio. So right now, you're getting your best information about the equation of state before the two stars have actually touched. So if we put all of our known constraints as of today. This is what we get. Um, we have our mass. We have our radius. We have essentially two points from NICER. Uh, essentially, there's, there's two separate collaborations within NICER, which is why there's two bands. And so this is a good consistency chat that they're overlapping with each other. Um, so these are two different stars, a heavier neutron star, a lighter neutron star. And then this third, um, these two are, again, two different methods, but this comes from LIGO. Um, and so basically when you measure your tidal deformability, there are certain universal relations that help you go from your tidal deformability to a mass radius relation. So these are these three points. And those are the things that we know for sure as of today. Um, now you see up top, there's things with question marks. This one uh, was something where it was a black hole and a compact object that we don't know what it is. It might be a neutron star, it might not. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, if this is true, this would be the heaviest neutron star measured. And it would have definitely implications from an equation of state point of view. Additionally, there was another thing, it's called uh, V723 which is in some sort of eccentric binary. And again, it's a mystery object. We don't know what it is. So what kind of questions do we want to answer here? Um, there's, there's a lot that we can look at when you're thinking about neutron stars. Do they have hyperons? What can we understand about these, these weird nuclear process phases? Are there quarks inside? Are there specific phase transitions, right? Like, could there be a first order phase transition in neutron star? And what would be the implications of that? Are these, there are these colors uh, superconducting phases? Is the neutron star spinning? There's just a lot of questions that, that we can think about once we start thinking of the equation of state of neutron stars. Jackie, can I ask a question? Sure, go for it. Uh, so on your, on your slide with the mass versus the radius, uh, yeah. the previous slide. 
So there's some like interesting areas, particularly I uh, looked at the bottom right that looks like it's available. And there's some region to the left of the nicer one. So mm -hmm. is there any constraint that come from like that 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 come from stellar formation that could also go in here? Because I mean they tell you that you can have a large radius but smaller mass, for example. Right. So if you're looking at like um, a supernova, right? So that's how you'd form a neutron star, right. then um, that's actually at finite temperatures. So there's some oh, slight oh. differences there. I, I think it can get up to like a 10 MeV or something, which means you're slightly different region of the phase diagram. So in principle, there is a third axis here, which is basically the temperature. And there mm -hmm. could also be additional structure in that, in that dimension. Right. And you could actually add another axis, actually two other axes, which would be magnetic fields and spin. Oh, but in okay. those two axes, they have to be really, really big. Um, so a small magnetic field is not going to do much. Small spin is not going to do much. So if you are an extremely large magnetic field or extremely large spin, that would slightly change um, this as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, but this is basically um, considering only very old neutron stars that have been sitting around long enough that we assume the temperature is zero. But it's a good question. Great. So, so to kind of tackle these things, we need a collaboration. Um, us nuclear physicists can't know everything. We need to talk to the gravity people who can help us calculate some of these observables and think about new observables as well. So this has been um, an ongoing collaboration here. Um, and Nico and Hung are, are also here at Illinois with me. And we're a part of ICASA, which is the um, Illinois Center of Advanced Studies for of the Universe. Uh, it's a new um, initiative here where we're bringing together like nuclear particle gravity, um, computer science, and a lot of other cool things. And then we've brought in Veronica Dexheimer, who's a nuclear astrophysicist and an expert on the equation of state. And then there's my student Pravastor, who has also been working with me um, in terms of generating equations of state. And so what we wanted to do to, to explore a lot of these ideas is we wanted to kind of have a model agnostic approach. So we have these data points, right? And we wanted to see what is possible, what kind of equations of state could we create um, in order to you know, extract microscopic information. So you wanna kind of think of like, what is your band or your regime of equations of state that are applicable knowing all these constraints? Um, so what we did is we, we made this um, sort of model where you put in different low densities regimes, we call crusts, and then we want to put in cool nuclear physics stuff. So we want to think about, like, could there be a first order phase transition? You put the speed of sound to zero then. Could there be kind of weird bumps or spikes? I'll explain what those come from in a second. And at really, really high densities, you expect it to go back to a PQCD limit, which is uh, the speed of sound is going to one third. So we've put in all of this and we've created this model. It's also open source. If you want to play with it yourself, you, you can check it out here. Um, but the main thrust of this model is we start from the speed of sound, and then from there we calculate the equation of state. So you, you might ask, why do we do this? Well, the speed of sound lets you put in structure. Um, so for instance, if you have a first order phase transition, you expect essentially a, a long plateau in your speed of sound where um, the speed of sound is equal to zero. If you have a second order phase transition, that would be super cool because that would be a quantum critical point within a neutron star. And I don't know what that, that really means. Um, but what you would find is that your speed of sound goes to zero and that you would have uh, the second derivative of your pressure would actually diverge. Um, and so there'd be some interesting implications for that. So anyways, we thought going from the speed of sound made a lot of sense because you could put in these things by hand. Also, um, if you get new degrees of freedom, you kind of get these like bumps and wiggles in your speed of sound as well. So what sort of implications do you have? Well, one of the, the probably biggest smoking gun signal to say, I know for sure I have quarks inside a neutron star is I could create something called a mass toy. So I, I've given you kind of just cartoonish drawings of what a mass radius would look like if you had a clear first order phase transition within a neutron star. Basically what you do is you'd get this first stable branch here um, and you'd get then this red regime, which is an unstable branch. That means there would be no neutron stars. If you could measure every single neutron star in the, in the universe, neutron stars would never have this mass radius. But you would then find a second stable branch over here. So they're called mass twins because in principle you could measure this neutron star here, this neutron star here. They'd have identical mass, but very, very different radii. 
And this can kind of appear in different ways. You could see this here. You could see this um, if this, this transition happens at low mass as, as well. You could also see something called a connected twin. Uh, so if you have like a little bit of weaker first order phase transition, instead of having a disconnect, it just kind of bends over your mass radius relation. And so it would effectively be a mass twin still. Now, if you have a really weak first order phase transition, that actually might be very hard to measure because you get this, what we call kinky, you get this little kink here, um, but it wouldn't really look like a mass twin. It wouldn't be that clear. So this is kind of the concern is like for a weaker first order phase transition, it might be hard to measure. Now at this time, we just don't have enough data. As you saw, the bands are still pretty big. And so it's hard to say yet if, if mass twins exist, but we're looking for them. To give you a kind of idea, um, because I know from the heavy ion perspective, we're really interested in finding you know, a, a critical point, a first order phase transition line. So what would that happen like inside a neutron star? So we created one equation of state where we just took and we made a much bigger first order phase transition line. So if we strengthen the first order phase transition, what happens? Well, you can kind of see here on the right for the weakest first order phase transition, um, it just looks like a very boring mass radius. It just kind of goes straight up and, and bends over a little bit. And that, there's nothing really exciting there. But if you continue to increase your first order phase transition line, like making it stronger and stronger, you start bending over your mass radius relation. Eventually you've created mass twins. And what you do, if it's stronger and stronger, those mass twins are more pronounced. They move farther and farther apart. As you can see here, this is, would be very, very easy to observe. You have about a 12 kilometer difference. And with the precision today, that's something you could probably measure. And the other thing that's been really exciting in the nuclear asteroid community is the potential of having a very heavy neutron star, because this is gonna make a lot of nuclear astrophysicists go back to the drawing board and rethink their equations of state. So what happened um, not that long ago is there was this measurement of GW190814, and it was something, some compact object, we don't know what it is, that was around 2.5 to 2.67 solar masses. And so this just made the whole community quite exciting because we don't know what it is. It's either the smallest black hole that anybody's ever measured or the heaviest neutron star. Either way, it's really cool. So you can imagine that the second it came out, there was a ton of papers that appeared on the archive as you know, these things do, uh, and a lot of different theories. So some people thought it could be a primordial black hole. Some people thought it could be a neutron star that's spinning like crazy. Um, some people thought there could be exotic components, you know, like hyperons or very, very special interactions that are happening there. There's a lot of ideas that came about. But what did LIGO actually conclude? So if you read their paper, um, they concluded they thought it was not a neutron star. They said comparisons between the secondary mass and several current estimates of the maximum neutron star mass suggest that GW190814 is unlikely to originate in a neutron star black hole coalescence. Uh, and they basically made four arguments. The first is they found a tension between the larger maximum mass and other constraints. So basically looking at the mass radius, looking at the tidal deformability, they couldn't create an equation of state that fit within all these known constraints and produce such a heavy neutron star. Now this is something that goes into a lot of nuclear physics. So we're gonna come back to this point. The other issue they pointed out is there was no visual component. However, this is far from shocking. Um, in fact, since this measurement, there's been other um, black hole neutron star coalescence, and they never had a visual component from these ones. They only said it was a neutron star because of the mass was really in the neutron star regime. Um, and so what can happen if you have a really heavy black hole is it just swamps any sort of visual component and you wouldn't expect that. So I think this point's not particularly surprising. Another point that they had is galactic population and modeling arguments. So this is just a statistical analysis that basically we haven't seen a neutron star this heavy yet. So, you know, that could just be, we're unlucky. Um, and then the other kind of main issue is that we can't do the spin. So this idea that super, it's spinning super, super fast and that makes it heavier, um, you can't test it because this information is swamped from being a black hole. But the thing we can talk about, and this one we can actually check is, this depends a lot on the assumptions you make about the equation of state. So can you make equation of state that produce really, really heavy neutron stars and still fit within all the other constraints? So let's look what they did. Um, they basically wanted to make functional forms of the equation of state that they could test against their data. Uh, and so to do that, you have to have certain constraints. You need to fit within the mass radius relation so that that's fine. 
You also want your system to be causal. So that means your speed of sound can't be faster than the speed of light. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and then you, you can calculate this adiabatic index. So that's fine. Everything up until this point has zero assumptions and is well-defined. Now, the issue is in order to create functional forms of the equation state, you do have to make some assumptions. And so you take this expansion. Um, these are called spectral equations of state. And that right there is an assumption. That is the point that you kind of are assuming that your equation state are relatively smooth. And we'll get back to this point in a second. Additionally, they take priors where they fit um, some other uh, nuclear physics equations of state. And so they're also putting those priors into their model as well. So let's talk a little bit about the speed of sound in a neutron star before we move on. One thing to know, um, you know, in, in regular air, the speed of sound is much, much, much smaller than the speed of light, right? If we're talking about air. Now in a neutron star, that's probably not the case at all. And it could be that the speed of sound is actually going really up to the causal limit, really up to the speed of light. And so this is not a particularly new idea. It came out in around 2014, I think, um, where people started building these bumps into the speed of sound of neutron stars. The re at first, it was kind of a phenomenological argument is that they were measuring very heavy neutron stars. And it was only through a big bump in the speed of sound could they get a stiff enough equation of state that would actually produce a really heavy neutron star. Now, more recently, theorists are quite clever. Um, and so Larry McClear and Sanjay Reddy had, they looked at quarkionic matter. Um, and so this is basically some sort of uh, crossover phase transition into quarks within a neutron star. And you get this giant bump in the speed of sound. And it's getting very, very close to the causal limit. So this is something that's now starting to become much more well motivated for nuclear physics. There's actually other models that can get bumps as well. Like if you have hyperons, you get bumps that get above, um, that get closer to you know, the causal limit. You can also do this um, with other sort of crossover phase transitions into quarks as well. And so what we wanted to do is, is build these into our models and test if we put bumps into our speed of sound, could you actually get up to a heavy enough neutron star and still fit within your, all your mass radius constraints. And the kind of long story short is yes, you absolutely can, is we put in bumps into our equation of state, like here for our speed of sound. And we found that depending on where this bump it is, if it happened at a low enough density, that indeed you can definitely fit within all the known constraints. You see it has to fit in here and here, and it has to get up to at least 2.5 solar mass. And so it's pretty easy to build an equation of state that can fit within all null constraints and um, still get make a very, very heavy neutron star, as you can see here. So the question is, well, what happened? Well, in fact, I can create many more. I just showed an example of one, but I can put a lot of crazy structure into my speed of sound, and I still create a many, many uh, equations of state that can fit all the constraints and mass radius and reach 2.5 solar masses. So what exactly. causes that? Jackie, can I ask a question again? So I'm not following this bump uh, discussion. So I, I, I see that making, you know, you have these funny curves and they can give you larger masses, but like mm -hmm. what exactly is, it's like a perturbation, right? In the structure of the neutron star, like where would these bumps come from that lead to different speed of sounds? Right, so um, like I said before, is the bumps are generally coming in most models from some sort of crossover phase transition into quarks. So if you look back a few slides, this, this is from quarkionic matter. Um, so this is this you know, old idea from, from Larry and Rob Przarski um, of one way to kind of talk about deconfined matter in neutron stars. And so when they, when they have their model, basically they see this very large bump in the speed of sound. Now there's other models too that, that nowadays get this, actually a lot of different models do it. Um, and that bump exactly corresponds to when you have a phase transition. Yeah, that's when you're having your, well, it's not a real phase transition, it's a crossover. Oh, okay, right. So if, if I have a different transition that, and that happens at a different pressure, for example, I would get a different like value for the, for the bump. Um, yeah, so if I have, so that's kind of here, is if I have it, the transition happening at different baryon densities, that's normally how we think of things. Oh, so I see, okay, okay. Yeah. So if it's looking at like two times saturation density, which is not a horrible assumption, 
um, so you're twice as dense as the nucleus, then you see this bump here, and that gives you this mass radius curve here. And, and actually that's a very reasonable one. It goes straight up through the LIGO that all the nicer data and hits um, you know, right around 2.7 or something like this, solar masses. Mm -hmm. right. And so there's a lot of, I, I kind of skipped over a lot of the details, but I can make these bumps wider. I can change the location. I can change the slope and stuff. And so there's a lot of variation that I can put into here um, because again, we don't know anything from first principles in neutron stars. Mm -hmm. So whether, you know, the bump is like here or here or like this width or that width, those all depend on a bunch of parameters in these equation of state models, some of which have wide error bars on them, you know, so like the kind of, kind of the finer details are fuzzy in a lot okay. of these um, models. Yeah. So the point though is, is that you can build a lot of equations of state. As, as you see, I put in a bunch of crazy things here and I'm able to create, construct equations of state that, that get up to large enough maximum masses. Um, so the question then is, is what happened? Why did LIGO conclude that they can't do this? So what we did is, is what you can do from the speed of sound, you just integrate and you get your pressure versus energy density. So you have your equation of state then. And so we looked at their posteriors from their analysis, and this is this band here. So they predicted this, if, if it is a neutron star, this is what the equation of state looks like. And then we compared this to our equations of state, and you can see they look very different. Um, this effect here basically is coming from the bump, right? And they, it's kind of clear that their equations of state are much more boring looking. They look much smoother and they're not taking into account that you could have bumps and wiggles, which are pretty well motivated from nuclear physics. And so we wanted to test this is we actually built the exact same model as they did with these uh, spectral equations of state. And then we tried to fit them to our equations of state, right? So they should give us the same equation of state, the same um, mass radius relation, like, is their little you know, model they used flexible enough to reproduce our equation of the state? And sort of the moral of the story is if you look on average, you could do a chi-squared fit and it looks kind of okay. But the problem is, is that you do get very big deviations. So look at this like solid red line. This is their fit compared to our actual equation state. The problem is it's deviating exactly in the regime that matters. And so then if I calculate the mass radius relation, this is the one from the spectral equation of state. It doesn't get up to as large maximum masses as ours does. It, it's just too smooth. Um, and having these big jumps in there actually helps to fit both the mass radius relation here and get up to heaviest enough neutron star. And so we tested a bunch of these and it's always the same thing is that once you fit to a spectral equation of state, it has slight adjustments that make it worse and make always the fit worse. So the kind of main moral of the story is that they can't take into account all these bumps and kinks and jumps that you would get from a realistic equation of state. Um, and, and so just to kind of show you what realistic equation of state look like, I've kind of gathered, we spoke to a bunch of different groups and, and kind of in, uh, uh, assembled them here. And you can see this is uh, the one from Gordon Bain and his collaborators here. So you've got a good bump going, you've got a little kink here. Um, these little bumps and, and spikes here come from hyperons as they switch on. You can get something to go to zero. This would be some sort of first order phase transition. Um, you can get really crazy plateaus. So there's a lot of weird structure that you can get in there. Uh, the boring looking one, this green one, is, is a boring equation of state. Basically, it's just neutrons, protons, and electrons. And at some point, you don't really want that because it becomes a causal. And so that's a big red flag whereas these more interesting ones are causal. Um, and so we kind of expect to have stuff like either hyperons or quarks switching on around the, these densities. So then the question is, okay, great. I built an equation state, but that's not necessarily a smoking gun signal. I don't know the, the equation state from first principles. How do I know for sure if this super heavy object is a neutron star or not? And so for that, you have to go to the tidal deformability. And I kind of talked about this a little before, but as these two stars in spiral, they, they squish, right? Um, and this is just from the gravitational pull. And how much they squish really depends on the equation of state. And one thing though, that's, that's very important to pull up, point out is that black holes don't squish. They don't tidally deform. So this, if you get a finite value for your tidal deformability means it has to be a compact object. It has to be um, a neutron star is what I mean to say. 
Now for light neutron stars, you, you can squish quite a bit because they're not as dense. And for heavy neutron stars, it's, it's a lot harder to squish them, right? So just think of a very dense object. It's gonna be much harder to change its shape than a, than a softer object. And so we looked at all these equations state that fit all the constraints and we're trying to extract what would the tidal deformability be? And is this measurable with today's detectors? So what we did here is we looked at like a 2.5 solar mass neutron star and we can extract what the tidal deformability is. It's around, um, I believe like three to 20. This is a dimensionless um, uh, quantity. And the main issue though, is that with given what we have from the LIGO Virgo collaboration today is you could only measure on the order of magnitude of like 100 to 400. You just don't have the design sensitivity to get down to these really, really small values of the tidal deformability. So you would need basically third generation detectors to get to this. So at this point in time, measuring what we did, we just don't have the design capability to do this, but this will be possible in the future. Now, the other thing that's super interesting, and I actually just found out about this last week, um, is there, there is a star that has been measured. Um, it was originally measured around 2008, but because they just didn't have enough statistics, enough information, you had this really, really wide posterior band and you didn't really know what the, the, the mass of that star is. Um, uh, they originally measured around 2.92, but we had huge, you know, like huge error bars. So you can't really say if that's a heavy neutron star or not, but this is something optical. You can see it. So it has to be a neutron star. Now, after observing it for many, many years, many improvements, you can see that they have a much thinner probability distribution here that's peaked around 2.6 solar masses. Um, and it just drops off very, very quickly. So it seems extremely likely that you've measured something that could be around 2.5 to 2.7 solar masses that really genuinely is a neutron star. Um, so this work is, is still preliminary. I'm very excited to see this paper come out soon. Um, but it does seem to be indicating that that maybe these there really are these heavy neutron stars, and that means that we have to contend with the speed of sound and these bumps in the speed of sound. So kind of moving and shifting gears a little bit, I talked about neutron stars, um, but you know, Rogov asked, well, what about finite temperatures, right? What, like what about supernova? And, and then that's kind of the next stage of the talk is that we have both neutron star mergers and heavy ion collisions that reach these finite temperatures. Um, and so I'm going to be mostly talking about kind of this fixed target regime, these very low energies of heavy ion collisions and the overlap that they have with neutron star mergers. Um, now, the kind of point to make here is everything's very dynamical. They don't just, you know, give you one data point like you know, <laughs> and you can kind of see how you like pass and, you know, span through the, the QCD phase diagram here. There are sort of subtle differences that we should keep in mind, though. So for a heavy ion collision, what you put in is what you get out. Um, so you're putting it into the nuclei and they don't have any initial strangeness. So there's no, uh, it's strangeness neutral. Additionally, it has a very, very short lifetime, so you don't have enough time to undergo weak decays, so your strangeness is conserved within your system. And the kind of last point is that you have almost equal number of protons and neutrons in your system. This just goes by what nucleus that you're colliding. If you're colliding a heavy nucleus, this is around 0.4. If you're colliding something like oxygen 16, it, it's really the exact same number of protons and neutrons. Um, and so we think of this as symmetric matter. And that means that this is gonna be on a slightly different axis of the phase diagram compared to neutron stars. Because first of all, neutron stars do have a much longer lifetime. And so strange quarks disappear. They can undergo weak decays. Um, and so our S quarks turn into up quarks. Additionally, that means that this is probably not in equilibrium because your strange quarks are disappearing. Um, and kind of the last thing though, and this is actually very important, is that neutron stars have to be electrically neutral, otherwise they're not stable. So that means that we have the same number of, of, of positive and negatively charged particles, which is very different than heavy ions, where you, where you have um, basically an equal number. Um, all right, so how does this affect actually if you had a first order phase transition in um, the phase diagram? So you can see here for, for uh, neutron stars, this would be your first order phase transition line in this specific model. And then if you look at symmetric matter, which is heavy ion collisions, you would have this black line here. So kind of the moral of the story is that if we're looking at low temperatures, 
um, your heavy ion collisions is going to see a phase transition at a slightly higher chemical potential than what um, neutron stars are going to see. They're, they might see the first sort of phase transition earlier than a heavy ion collision. But the differences are pretty small. So it's not a horrible assumption to go back and forth between the two of them. Now, the other kind of issue that we're running into, though, um, is that the equation of state, we don't have it across the whole phase diagram, right? There's the whole Fermi and sign problem. So it's like a patchwork quilt. Uh, if you go to high temperatures and low densities, you can direct, directly calculate this from lattice case B. If you go to low temperatures, and then actually some pretty decent densities, you can do a hadron resonance gas. But once you get to really high densities, um, especially high temperatures, you need some sort of effective model that includes quarks in it. And then at lower temperatures, you need some sort of baryonic matter. This could be like chiral effective field theory. There, there's a lot of things you can do, but how do these different equations they fit together? It's like a patchwork quilt. Um, other issues are a lot of these codes are proprietary. So you can't, you know, I can't just go grab the code and start running and changing parameters. They're not optimized. Um, they're not ready for high performance computing. Sometimes they're run on one single person's laptop and then for a month or something, and that's how they get the equation of state. They don't connect smoothly to lattice and they're what we call spaghetti codes. Um, so I don't know if you've heard of that, but that means that like maybe the code's 20 years old and you've had many different students and postdocs that have all added components and sometimes they have different variables and it's, it's all kind of entangled. Um, and so how do you deal with that problem? Well, one thing that we've had is we've created this new collaboration. It's called Muses, which is a modular unified solver of the equation of state. And so we want to take many of these very, very well-known codes and optimize them, update them, and put them together. Like, basically, we want to find the right parameter sets that you can smoothly meld lattice QCD into something that you could use in neutron stars and low densities, or sorry, low, low energies and heavy ion collisions. Um, and so this is a brand new collaboration. It's got 16 institutions. And I have students that are kind of working on all ends of this. Some are working on the hydrogen resistance gas side. Some are working. Um, on the neutron star side and some working at like the high temperature, high density that covers both ends of it. We also are gonna have um, this collaboration with experimentalists as well. So we'll have the option to have observable techniques. So like thermal fits, calculate the mass radius, the time of deformability, all in open source code. Now, in terms of what happens inside a neutron star merger first, let's, let's explore what happens when you're at finite temperatures. You could have something like this where you have quarks in your, oops, in your system. I, I don't think the, the video is working, which is fine. You can go to the YouTube link and watch it. Um, but what happens is basically there, when you collide the two stars, you could definitely get quarks because you're switching on temperature and it allows you to reach new degrees of freedom that you wouldn't be able to, which is two boring neutron stars by themselves. Oh, now, now it's working, but I'll just continue onwards. You can watch the video now if you want. Um, now, if you could actually measure the merger phase and what happens afterwards, there are some nice signals for, for sort of phase transition that would be quite, uh, quite interesting. Um, for instance, if you just have hadrons versus with quarks in your system in your equation state, that's going to change your ring down as you go to a black hole. Um, another thing that could happen is you have this, this frequency peak. It's going to actually shift the location of where that peak is, depending if you have a first sort of phase transition or not. And another thing is that you can actually have a delayed first order phase transition. Maybe it doesn't happen immediately once they touch, but later on in your system, and you would expect different frequency signals in that case as well. So this is all awesome. And, and hopefully then with future detectors, some of these things could be measured. Um, but again, right now we still have the signal to noise ratio issue. So probably what's gonna happen or what, what I'm expecting is that we'll be able to measure something like this in heavy ion collisions first. Um, now, at really, really high energies, which a bulk of our, our committee has been working on for years, is these two heavy ions are Lorentz contracted into very, very thin pancakes. It's all two-dimensional, basically. Um, and the nuclei just pass right through each other, um, but they dump a ton of energy. And so since they're just passing through each other, baryons aren't getting stopped. Basically, you're dumping like a bunch of gluons. Um, and so there's no finite baryon density. Basically, your number of baryons to antibaryons are equal because you're starting from an initial condition that's just gluons. Um, so it's too quick to, to do baryon capture. But if you run at a very low center of mass energy, what happens is that, that these guys are no longer you know, completely flat pancakes. They're not Lorentz contracted. They're, they have some sort of finite width to them. They're really full three-dimensional. 
And that means it takes longer for these two nuclei to pass through each other. And so as that happens, there's enough time for baryons to actually be captured. And so they get stuck in your system and they give you a finite baryon density. Um, and so this then changes. So as you go to lower and lower beam energies, you're going to larger and larger baryon densities. It's sort of the moral of the story here. And so I, started, I tried to plot this out uh, with all the known experiments. And then I bothered a lot of people to see if I had all the beam energies correct. But this kind of gives you an idea of what is being explored today. Um, at LHC, we're essentially at zero um, baryon densities. At top RIC as well, I would say up to about here is it's, you can essentially say that the chemical potential or the baryon density is zero. Now, once you go to the RIC beam energy scan and especially um, star fixed target, then you can see that we, we do definitely get out into finite chemical potential, finite baryon densities. And so this is helping us to pr probe this upper right hand side of the, the, the QCD phase diagram with finite temperature and finite baryon density. Um, there are also other ongoing experiments. There's hotties that's at very, very low beam energy. So it's really large densities. I think the, the maximum estimates I've seen is, is around chemical potential is 800 MeV or around two times saturation density. So it's not so far off from the neutron star territory, but it's at finite temperatures. Um, and then you have um, NA61, Shine, which is also doing these, these regimes. And you have two planned future facilities, uh, FAIR and NECA, that are going to get right in these kind of middle beam energies. Um, and this, the purpose for this is to look both for a QCD critical point and for a sort of phase transition line. All of these are looking for that. Now, one of the clear signals would be if you could measure the kurtosis. Uh, basically, if you have a critical point, it has to be followed by a first order phase transition line. And so what you look for is you take your fourth derivative of your momentum, um, the scales with a correlation link. So you're expecting, basically long story short, is you're looking for a peak in this thing. And if you have a peak like this or this, that's a signal that you've measured a critical point. Now there's a lot of details in here um, that I won't go into, but I just wanna point out that this is an active thing that's going on in STAR right now. Um, and, and hopefully there'll be data out soon for the beam energy scan run too to tell us one way or another um, what's going on there. But I do wanna show a little bit of comparison of how heavy ions compare in terms of dynamics to neutron stars. And so you can see up top, this is a numeric relativity simulation. Um, basically what they're doing is you can use like ideal hydrodynamics or magneto hydrodynamics. You, at this point in time, they haven't put viscosity into their system, um, but then you couple this to general relativity. And so you solve this all numerically and you can see when the stars start touching, how they're interacting, um, and then kind of what the final state looks like over here. And honestly, it looks a lot like very low energy heavy ion collisions where you can see the two nuclei have just touched, they've merged together and they're coming out like this. And so this was a, a recent nature paper from Hotties where they found that at the finite temperature regime, there's some overlap in the QCD phase diagram. So Hotties goes to around 70 MeV and temperature, and it's not so far off from what you're seeing in neutrons are mergers at like the, the hottest temperature for them. So if you kind of plop these onto the phase diagram, um, it's important to note though, that when you have a merger or heavy ion collision, it's not one temperature or chemical potential you're just doing, but it's a whole range of them because these are fields, right? Um, and so you could see here, this is from a uh, neutron star mergers. This would be if you have a first order phase transition line here, you can see how it's passing through the QCD phase diagram in a single merger. And this is a, another comparison for a heavy ion collision. Again, it's just one specific beam energy, but it spreads out very, very far across the uh, phase diagram in just one single effect. Now, the other thing that hasn't been taken into account yet, really, is the effect of viscosity on these things. So you can get stuff that's not in equilibrium, um, you know, like friction between different layers of a fluid, um, how quickly it expands or contracts. And once you put those in, this would be if you have ideal hydro, and once you have viscosity, um, that kind of smears out even further how you pass through the phase diagram. So these are extra considerations that one has to take into account when you're trying to think of like, what beam energy you're at and how it passes through the phase diagram. So this is work from, from two of my students that, that we recently had published. Now let's talk a little bit more about these fixed target um, experiments, because this is really the regime where we think there's overlap. In fact, there's these two points from Hotties. One is from this nature paper where they've extracted the temperature using dileptons. Um, and this is the estimate of the temperature and chemical potential. 
And this point here is from freeze out. So that's the point where we, where we would assume that you're, you're done, right? You don't get any information beyond that point. Um, and it's also compared to an estimate of what the first order phase transition line might look like. This is from a holography model. If it's lattice QCD quite well at, at vanishing chemical potentials, again, it's an estimate, it's an effective um, theory, but it's probably the best estimate we have right now of location of the critical point <clears throat> and the first order phase transition line. So it could very well be that even at these very, very low beam energies, we're in a regime that, that we could have um, some sort of quarks in our system. So that's one of the kind of big questions that's, that's going on right now in the field is what's happening at these very low beam energy. Do you have quarks or do you just have something that are like nucleons in your system? And this will really help to interpret what's happening in neutron star emerges as well at finite temperatures. Um, so, so what do people do? Well, about 20 years ago, um, people tried using just a hadronic model and extracting the equation of state from heavy ion collisions. Um, now, again, this is 20 years old, so there's a lot that we've learned since then, um, but these old models didn't really consider temperature, they didn't consider viscosity that we know of today, they didn't have hydrodynamics, um, but they extracted this from something called collective flow measurements. And that's kind of the key point here, uh, is basically when you have two heavy ions collide, there's some sort of impact region that then has large pressure gradients here. As you can see, it pushes your system outwards, and using hydrodynamics, you can see that you get this kind of almond shape that then correlates to a final state almond shape as well here. And this is something you can measure experimentally. And so you measure your, your, your they're called collective, uh, it's a four-year series, basically here, you just add up your particle spectrum, you take a four-year series, and you can measure these things directly. And so you then take your theoretical models and compare them to these collective flow measurements and you play with your different equations of state and you try and extract your equation of state. So that's, that's like kind of the idea of what they're using to extract the equation of state back in the days. Now, the issue though, is if you're only considering hadronic degrees of freedom, especially these little beam energies, that's only part of the story. There, there's no reason to believe it's just from hadronic degrees of freedom. So there was a really interesting paper published around 2013 that actually tried to break up what are the different contributions from collective flow in heavy ion collisions? Is it just from hadrons? And the answer is no. Uh, if you go to the very, very low beam energies, you can see that the vast majority of the thing that gives you this collective flow is coming, this is, it says before hydro, this basically means the shape of your initial condition. So how these heavy ions collide and it, what that impact region looks like is basically telling you mostly what your collective flow is. The next thing is the hydrodynamic phase. So this could be like when you have deconfined quarks and gluons, that gives you a little bit of a contribution. And then the final stage is what happens afterwards. That's the hadrons. So really what you're getting from your hadrons and what your quark and plasma phase are about equal contribution. And the main contribution is actually from your initial condition itself. Um, so that doesn't, so just putting in a hadronic phase is missing actually a lot of what could be happening for this collective flow. And it would give you misleading results for the equation of state. Uh, now, if we look at more modern calculations, this has been explored. There's been many, many updates in the past 20 years to these models. And so using a hadronic only model seems to fail quite miserably, unfortunately, with the data. Um, so these are the data points here. And you can see that the theory predictions are quite a bit off from the data. Um, now, if you then take and you couple that to hydrodynamics, so that would mean you are putting in uh, quarks and gluons into your system, it, it starts looking a lot better. And you can see here are the data points here, and this is the theory calculation. Now, it's not perfect. There's actually many, many updates that need to happen to these theory calculations that haven't been done yet, um, but it looks like it's going in the right direction. So the point is, it looks like these, these low energy heavy ion collisions are probably seeing um, quark and gluon degrees of freedom that are contributing to the collective flow. And that needs to be then considered when one's extracting equation state and then trying to compare um, to neutron star mergers. Now, I won't go into all the details here, this is kind of a mess, but I will say that uh, this is actually a very active thing that my group is working on, is trying to make a lot of these upgrades needed to compare to these very low beam energies. Uh, it's, it's a huge effort. Um, it, there's a lot that needs to go into these systems. You need to put in viscosity. You need to put the effect of how uh, quarks and gluons diffuse through the hydrodynamics. 
you need to change your equation of state, you need to change your initial condition. So it's, it's a huge, huge effort. And it's actually been done by many different theory groups right now. Um, but this will hopefully help us to get to the point to actually be able to extract the equation of state from heavy ion collisions and then actually do direct comparisons with neutron star mergers, which will be really, really exciting um, when we have that, when we're at that stage. That brings me to my summary. Um, hopefully I've convinced you that if we have some sort of first order phase transition, there'd be a number of really interesting consequences. There'd be consequences of neutron stars. You could potentially have mass twins. Um, there'd be consequences for neutron star mergers themselves. And also this is a huge search right now in the heavy ion collision for looking for first order phase transition or a critical point. Um, additionally, I think for, for you know, stuff like star fixed target, which is extremely exciting, uh, we really need these sort of efforts to, to further constrain the equation of state, understand what's going on at finite temperatures. But we got to be a little wary because um, we need two things. We need many, many updates to theoretical codes. And then once that happens, we also need a lot of data from the experimentals. I didn't really go into all the details there, um, but there's a lot of things that we need to then constrain our models and try and extract the equation of state. So it's a pretty exciting time. And hopefully, you know, in a few years, we'll have a much better picture of what's going on there. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Jackie. That was super interesting. Um, we have questions. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Kate. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. That was awesome. I definitely learned a lot. Um, I have a pretty basic question that goes back to one Sorry. of the beginning slides you showed that had the QCD Lagrangian on it. Yes. Um, I mean, I'll just shoot, but um, so I hear this a lot, right? People will say, okay, like we can't really calculate this mm -hmm. and then they move on. But I guess I just don't don't understand what that means. Um, like from a quantum field theory perspective, like is there like is there an integral that doesn't converge or like what is mm -hmm. what is uncalculable about that? Yeah, so basically what you need to do um, is the, 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 the long answer short is that you do important sampling to solve this. Um, so you'd have different configurations that you would, you would sample from the lattice. And once you add fermions to your system, um, then you can actually get essentially a distribution that would become imaginary. And so when you say there's this fermion sign problem, basically when you're adding more fermions to your system than, than, than anti-fermions, um, it would require you to do an important sampling over an imaginary distribution, which we can't do. Okay. Um, so there's been techniques of trying to avoid this, like using some sort of reweighing technique. Um, there's, a, there's been uh, actually some of my collaborators that have been working quite extensively on this. Kind of the best path forward at this point in time is just taking a Taylor series. Um, so we just... What, what, what you do in this case is you can actually take uh, an imaginary chemical potential and that works out just fine. And then you extrapolate it to zero chemical potential. So you're basically finding that extrapolation as you go to the, the zero chemical potential access. Now you can do this while taking many derivatives and then you can get the coefficients of your Taylor series and expand out to the, the finite chemical potential regime. Um, and so that's kind of the standard thing that's done right now in the field. Um, there's other people that are now trying to think like how we could get something that looks like QCD, some sort of Hamiltonian, and then solve that in quantum computing. And so that that's another effort that's that's being made right now in the field. Okay, cool. Thanks. So yeah, just to follow up on that. So you mentioned like there might be some possibilities to solve, you know, the, this question on quantum computing. Um, is that like just the fact that we can have like more like a more powerful computing, computing resource that we can solve this problem? Or is there like some, I, I've heard about in other views that there are like some, um, you know, specific computing modes that basically just couples to the question, uh, we are a question of interest better that can allow like people to solve things with quantum computing better than the conventional like CPU computing. So it, which, which one is the case right here? Um, like, or is it also, for example, solvable with uh, hypothetically like, just a massive, uh, you know, super, uh, super computing farm? Like, which one, which one is the case here? I guess that's the question. Right. So um, it's, I, I'm not an expert in the quantum computing side, so I should give that caveat, but I've heard enough talks on it to at least say it, hopefully a reasonable answer. Um, but 
there, there's a few issues. Is one, um, there's you need a certain number of qubits to solve the problem. You also need a certain number of, I think, good qubits. So uh, there's some sort of um, difference between those, which I, I don't 100% know the difference. Um, and then you also need to find some sort of Hamiltonian that looks like QCD. So a lot of the things that I've seen people do, it's not exactly QCD that they're solving on the quantum computer. It's some sort of approximation of it. Um, and so there's a, a big effort right now for the people working on this is finding a good Hamiltonian that's as close to QCD as possible and that you can use these techniques on. Um, and so, the, the, and, I, and just to be clear, it's not just for the um, uh, finite chemical potentials that they're interested in, but another really big effort is doing this for transport coefficients. So looking at like shear and bulk viscosities, um, I kind of, you know, sort of hand-wavingly mentioned them in this talk, but, but this is actually another big issue. Um, with first principle calculations, you can't get to any sort of out of equilibrium effects as well. So I don't know if it was a perfect answer, but unfortunately it's not really my, my field of expertise. And that's very helpful, thank you. Oh. I have one question that might be very naive, but just from it. So when you look at uh, diagrams where you have a bunch of equations of state, they're like each individual lines. So as like, does should I interpret those individual lines as creating like a window where the possible equations of state can be anywhere within the, the regions where those lines vary? Or are each of those very specific lines where it would fall, it would be like one of that set. Right. So let me like actually go to a, a thing with that on there. Um, let's see here. This, this is good because I can just pick out one. So basically what you're seeing here is that each, like it would be better to write this almost as dots and each of these are different stars. So you can think of like, I had um, some really big star, right? I, I, I'm not, you know, on uh, expert on the modeling from like going to a regular star and how it dies. Um, and so the, it kind of depends on what the initial mass of that star is, but I have some heavy star that as it dies, it becomes this star right here, right? And th then I could have even a heavier star and as it dies, it becomes this star right here. But every star, if this is the correct, like this, let's say that was the answer. This is exactly the equation of state that QCD would give me. Um, then it would mean that regardless of the initial condition, the final state of the star has to fall on this line somewhere. It couldn't be here for instance. And so if I measured like every single neutron star in the galaxy, I would essentially reproduce this, this curve. So it's really a, a mass radius sequence because it's many neutron stars fit together. Um, so these are all like unique solutions basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. You basically just vary your central density and you get these different solutions. Now, what happens at some point is you continue to increase your central density and you'll see your mass radius decrease or your, sorry, your mass will decrease. And that means it's an unstable solution. So it would actually collapse to a black hole. So if I had, a, if I had an initial central density that's larger than this point here, that's actually gonna give me a black hole, not a neutron star. Gotcha, okay, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. And that's why the maximum mass is so important because the equation of state tells you how massive a neutron star you can produce before it turns into a black hole. Okay. And also just to be clear, like the black line here is, um, I guess I'm just not, not very sure what this black line here is. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So basically all of these equations, they have first order phase transitions in them. And so if you have a really big first order phase transition, um, you get a first stable branch and then this happens where it becomes unstable, right? So the, the, if I increase my central density, then my mass decreases. So these neutron stars would not be possible, this red line. So the black line's possible, the red line's not. And then if I continued increasing my central density further, I would have another, a second stable branch that would be possible. So now what happens to something that's like an intermediate mass star that turns into a neutron star um, and it falls here? I, I don't actually have the answer for you. This is, this is something that's an open question. It could be that it, it you know, grabs matter and becomes here, it becomes denser, or it could be that it actually loses some mass and becomes up here. So I don't, I, or it becomes a black hole, I don't know. <laughs> so that's an open question. 
Thank you. You're welcome. So, Jackie, I have one more question. Let, uh, sure. Let's come back to Star. Uh, and so, in the very end of your talk, you had uh, this discussion on the fixed target. So, we also took a lot of fixed target data this year and collider data at the same energy. So, like pre GV, 4 GV, 5, 7. So, what's the difference between Collider and fixed target at same energy. I mean, you might have different rapidity acceptance in the detector, but other than that, is there any fundamental difference? Um, that's a good question. I don't. I honestly don't know. I mean, the only thing I could think of is somehow the initial conditions would look different. But even then, I mean, you could always put stuff in the center of mass frame, so right. it's yeah. like it, it should be identical. It's just how it sprays out of there and how you all detect it. Um, you know, well, is the hot, so is the is is the hardest one fixed target or, or collider? No, no, well, so I mean, in general, colliders can reach higher beam energy, so it's hotter. No, no, no. I mean, the data from from hardest. Oh, that... it's fixed target. Yeah, I can go there. Um, so it's very, very low beam energy. You, you wouldn't have beams that would actually hit each other if it was collider mode. Oh, right. Okay. Because they would just go, go sideways. Yep. yep. <laughs> go like that. Exactly. So everything here uh, is all, this is all fixed target, fixed target, fixed target, fixed target. It's just Rick. I think Rick will be the first time, as far as I'm aware of, that you're having a collider overlapping with fixed target. You, you all should know better than me, but I, that that's what was my <laughs> Yeah, I forgot to respond to your Twitter thing. I mean, there, you're, you're missing the three GV collider point there. <laughs> oh, but I thought, that they, I thought they completely missed, so I didn't put it on there. Yeah, it's 3.85 GV collider. Yeah. Okay. But did you get any data from this at all? Yeah, this year. We have like some hundred million events or something. Oh, really? I didn't, I was not aware that you had yeah, a collider. Probably not tell you that, but yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this is revealing internal details <laughs> of the number of the number. Oh, no, it's, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah I, did. I wasn't aware that you were able to do that. So that's pretty exciting. Um, cool. Right. That's all I can say, really. Mm -hmm. Um, I have one quick question. When you uh, when you're talking about the neutron star black hole merger, and you talked about how LIGO had like a boring equation of state, I miss how they got to that versus like how you guys got to your more interesting equation of state. It was yeah, it's uh, that was said earlier, but it, this is similar. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that that's a good question. Um, basically, what happened was that you know equations of state have changed a lot over time. And so the original equation state were like neutron, protons, electrons, and only, you know, there was a lot of thoughts on, on how to put quarks and gluons, but you need a computer to do this. And you need, you know, a lot of technology to really build out these more advanced equations state with all these hyperons and all these extra particles. So I think a lot of times while there were thoughts that this could exist, actually building into the models and running them and giving reading reasonable equation state takes time and not in so historically, um, the equations of the state that, that they had access to were predominantly boring ones. Um, and so when you fit from like these wide range equations of state, it doesn't mean it's actually a good equation of state. They just picked from like open source. Like there's a, there's a website called Compose that has a bunch of equations of state. And so they like draw from those. Um, and so, you know, if, if you're using kind of outdated ones that don't necessarily fit the data or, you know, aren't perfect or, you know, maybe you know, someone did this like 10 years ago and put it on the website and they haven't updated their equation of state, um, that can lead to, to some issues. But also it's just simply an issue that, you know, it's, it's different communities. Like the gravity community doesn't, isn't always aware of everything that's going on. The nuclear community, vice versa. Um, and, you know, kind of the unique thing between our collaboration is we have real gravity people, right? So they're out there doing perturbation theory in Einstein's equations, which I don't know how to do. Um, and then we're, you know, we care about hyperons and quarks and stuff like that. And so it took us, um, so, so Nico and I, he's, he's the um, head of, of that collaboration. Uh, it took us about a year to just explain things, right? So yeah. I like... 
I, I, getting the Coleman knowledge took a long time because I was like, well, this is the chemical potential. And he's like, what's the chemical potential? <laughs> um, and then, you know, he'd be like, well, this is the title deformability. And I'm like, I have no clue what that is. So it was a lot of back and forth and like very slow conversations to get to the point where we were. Um, like it didn't ever occur to me that they would use these kind of equations of state, right? Because I was like, why don't you just use actual ones or something like that? So, so it was, you know, a lot of back and forth to actually figure out what the root of the problem was. That's really cool. It's, it's cool to think about how, I don't know, the two, two fields that kind of feel different can help each other. Cool. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's been fun. Yeah. Really fun. So I guess like the final, uh, one, one, one other thing I have in mind is like when you're talking about the difference between the neutron star and um, about collisions, mm -hmm. and there was like this uh, charge density versus uh, background density thing. I was wondering like uh, there's a factor of 0 0.4 or somewhere and I don't think I'm like quite understand it. Maybe it was, I don't know. Are you talking about when she compared the two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the charge difference, I think. So, yeah, this one or the there was a I think a previous yeah, one. Yeah, this uh, no 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 the, the one I just showed. Okay, I'm trying to go. Through, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, this exactly. Yes. Yeah. So is that okay? So four point four is supposed to be on the other end, or oh, can you repeat? I couldn't hear. So the the factor of zero point four mm -hmm. is this supposed to be on the right hand side? Otherwise, oh, yes, it. thank you. That is supposed to be on the right hand side. Yes. Oh, okay, now I understand. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, other questions? Any questions? I didn't, I didn't check. The, uh, okay, nothing on the chat. Okay. Um, then I think that's all. Thank you so much, Jackie, for coming. Thank you for having me.